Hello, everyone. Oh, I can't do the Facebook. Can someone else go, your co-host, see if you can go live? Because if I try to go live, it's asking me to log in and I can't log in from here. Mm -hmm. Sorry, where's that live feature located? If you go on more. Oh, more. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Can you do Facebook? Uh, for me, it just says breakout rooms when I click on more. No, oh, because I'm the host. Okay, well, that's a little bit of a problem. Let's see. Because I don't know my, that's one thing I encounter. Let me try the uh, YouTube and see if it'll let me do whatever I need to do. Okay. Let's see, Facebook. Not Facebook. This is, uh, this is YouTube. You have people in the waiting room. I got, uh, yep. I got them. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we deal with Afrofuturists and the UN a journey to PFAT. We look forward to having an exciting conversation with our presenters. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to put your hands up and or uh, write a comment in the chat. Thank you.
Got it, got it, got it. Okay, good. Welcome again, everyone. If you're please mute for the time being. I am Prophet and Yan Wu Cox. I guess I should turn my camera on for a second anyway. And we'd like to welcome you to our journey into Afrofuturism today. And this is just a quick agenda. Look at the agenda to see what, well, let's see, there's someone in the waiting room. Um, we welcome you and we ask each and every one of you to put your name, the location where you are on the planet and any organizational affiliations that you're part of in the chat. You can also mention why this particular topic um, is of interest to you. We're going to take a brief look at our partners for this event. Then we will have a couple of definitions and a video, and then we'll turn it over to our presenters who will do a general overview, let us know who they are. These outstanding speakers work extensively in the field of Afrofuturism in their own rights in their own areas. They'll do some updates. One does an update on Dubai Futures Conference, and then they will have a conversation and give you some other insights into how you can participate if you're not already doing so. We would then go to questions and answers. Uh, you can put those in the chat when we get to that point or either do the hand raise option. And then we'll wind up this event with for those of you who are already doing something in the field of Afrofuturism, to give you a minute or two just to state what that is and if you have any announcements that relate to your activities. So we begin with uh, our partners. And I have this, uh, let me take this bar that down. This is just a, uh, I'm sure at one point I will have a uh, AI or something that'll take care of that, but at the moment I don't. So we have Afro for UN. It is a WhatsApp group uh, that was launched in November, 2023. It gives you an opportunity to be a part of a group that's specifically looking at um, preparing for the uh, United Nations Summit. And here's the description of the group. It says, in preparation for the United Nations Summit on the future, we ask you to join or invite you to join with Black, black organizations, Afrofuturists, futurists, and civil society organizations from around the world to contribute to a strong United Nations system. Let's develop the future we want and sustainable future for each of us. And so there are several events coming up related to that. We have someone else in the waiting room. And so uh, our next partner is um, the International Civil Society Working Group. And I will turn it over to Courtney Andrews to explain what uh, that particular partner, who they are and how they came into being. Courtney, you're on. Um, hello, everybody. Can folks hear me okay? Yes. yes. Uh, and apologies again for not being on camera, um, but my name is Courtney Andrews. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm here to just share a little bit of information about the International Civil Society Working Group for the Permanent Form of People of African Descent, who is a partner for today's um, event, um, with the mission of the Working Group for the Permanent Form of People of Africa Descent to ensure that the um, forums continued success, especially in terms of perpetually reflecting the will and vision of people of African descent, as represented by the individuals, grassroots organizations, and movements that have and continue to mobilize the interest of people of African descent thus far. Um, this group was formed and efforts rapidly ramped up 2021, specifically um, in August of 2021 with the resolution 75314. Um, really trying to create a consultative mechanism for people of African descent and its relevant stakeholders, as well as a platform for improving the safety and quality of life um, and livelihoods of people of African descent. As this revolution was passed, this group really has been a part of a lot of the journey to make sure that the permanent forum activities um, move on the demands, um, the goals, and the mission and vision of what's to come. So... Just wanted to share that. And for those interested in learning more, please feel free to use the resources in the chat um, and looking forward to today's events as well. So I'll pass the mic back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Courtney. And as she mentioned, the charter for the International Civil Society is in the chat. You can read through that, see what's involved and 
And um, let's see, we have someone else here. And so we also have a partner with the uh, uh, African American Future Society, and um, Brother Ewell will be speaking about that when when he's on, um, as well as the European Minority Parliamentarian Caucus and the International Decade uh, for People of African Descent. So you'll hear more about that as we go forward. Moving right along. One of the things we're looking at, of course, with the main subject for today, let me move this bar again. Each time someone comes into the chat, it, it triggers that. But our main topic today is Afrofuturism. What is it looking like? And our journey to PFAD, but we want to be prepared for a September event on, at the United Nations on Afrofuturism. And we want to have a good representation from people of African descent. And you will talk more about that. So what is Afrofuturism? I pull these off the internet. So these are really novice kinds of things. They're not, um, you'll hear in great depth what it is by the time you finish this uh, session, if that would be one of our objectives, that by the time you finish this, you will know what Afrofuturism is. But according to Google anyway, it is a way of looking at the future and alternate realities through a black cultural lens. Black cultural lens means the people of the African continent, in addition to the diaspora, the Americas, Europe, et cetera. It is an artistic aesthetic, but also a kind of method of self-liberation or self-healing. And myself not being an artist, that's where I come in. It's during uh, the part that talks about self-liberation or self-healing and also healing for, for our community. And so what about the meaning of metaverse, which kind of fits into this in some way uh, the metaverse is defined uh, as a vision of what many in the computer industry believe is the next uh, iteration of the internet, a single shared in, in immersive, persistent 3D virtual space where humans exist, whose humans experience rather life in ways they could not in the physical world. And so let's take a look really quick at what some of the, um, again, more novice or common everyday, even media people kind of think about it and see uh, how it relates to what we do and what we will do. Metaverse and metaverse. Hey, let's talk about metaverse. By now, you've probably heard of the metaverse. From now on, we're going to be metaverse first, not Facebook first. But even with all this hype. And many are betting big that it could change the face of how we interact. We have to say it's pretty amazing. The metaverse might still be a little confusing. What is the metaverse? The metaverse is basically the successor state to today's mobile internet. It's an internet that is going to be a lot more immersive, more social possibly, a lot more engaging, more 3D. So it's almost like the internet's going to be all around us in some ways, breaking away from our phones, our desks. The metaverse is going to offer, at least in the way that we define it, let's say it's going to be Web 3.0. It's going to be a world that's going to be more seamless. It's going to give more opportunity for much better experiences, much more immersive experiences. And to get there, there are a lot of different technologies involved. You know, it is enabled by many different technologies. So AI, obviously, which is really hot right now, is part of the future state of the Internet. AR, VR, 5G, 6G, cloud computing, edge computing. There's an element of blockchain as well, possibly. So, yeah, it's kind of how we will experience the future state of the Internet. So that, to me, is part of that beginning idea and concept of how do we make the world more immersive. I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. Mark Zuckerberg made this announcement in late 2021, saying that his company is now going to be Metaverse first, not Facebook first. And other major brands and companies proceeded to join the Metaverse party. Fashion brands like Nike and Gucci created virtual experiences for customers to explore their history, products, and designs. Walmart built a virtual world called Walmart Land, where people can play games, attend concerts, and buy virtual merchandise for its avatars. But some people argue that the metaverse still has a long way to go. 
you know, as much as I don't necessarily always like seeing those headlines that proclaim the death of the metaverse, I understand that it, it was overhyped. There was just a lot. I think it's important to kind of understand that, especially for the younger generations, for Gen Z, but more so Gen Alpha, whatever happens in these virtual spaces is still very real, right? Just because it happens in Fortnite doesn't make it less real to them. It's very real. It's this continuum of the spaces they inhabit, which can be virtual and the physical world. The friends, the relationships they make are real. For a lot of us that are in this industry, it's also making sure that we explain <clears> to <throat> like, this is a long-term vision. It's a long-term play. We do have one more thing. And there are some notable companies making long-term plays on the metaverse. Apple unveiled in June 2023 its long-awaited Vision Pro, a mixed reality headset scheduled to be released in early 2024. Tech website The Verge demoed it and called it the best possible version of a VR headset. Also in 2023, BMW opened what it calls the world's first virtual factory, a digital twin of a factory that it can run simulations on before actually opening the real physical factory. BMW did this using NVIDIA's Omniverse platform, which its CEO has compared to the metaverse. Epic Games, the developers of the hugely popular Fortnite game, is also deeply invested in the metaverse, after raising $2 billion to advance the company's vision to build the metaverse. The LEGO Group, which announced a metaverse partnership with Epic Games, is also bullish on the metaverse space. Firstly, I don't think that Metaverse is going to be just one platform. I think Metaverse, at least in my view, should be platform agnostic. I think that's the benefit of it, is the fact that it's going to actually be agnostic to a particular platform, it's going to exist in different technologies, and it should be interoperable. And I think what's going to power it up is if people are able to move seamlessly through the, the experiences in the Metaverse versus actually being siloed into one particular platform. So whether it's on Roblox, Fortnite, NVIDIA's Omniverse, and through a Meta or Apple headset or something else entirely, there are a lot of different directions the metaverse could go. And that's the point, as technology, the internet, and the way we use both of them evolves. This is not gonna go away. The internet will continue to evolve. Where hardware is gonna continue to evolve beyond our phones, you know, what about that post-smartphone future? New wearables are gonna potentially open up new, new ways of us to engage with the internet. Those are all things that brands look at towards the horizon. So yeah, the long-term value is that things are moving fast, technology is converging, and a whole new generation that is gonna change things is slowly, you know, growing up. Very good. So now we get into the meat of our program today, and I don't see uh, Miss Yvonne on yet, so we're going to go right over to our um, our guest, special guest, extraordinary guest, who actually just came back from uh, Dubai, and so. Let me get this down so you can see his bio and I'll go through it really quick. So this is Mr. Yule Anderson and Yule is president and founder of the African-American Future Society. Mr. Anderson is a graduate of the Dartmouth College and holds a master's degree in future studies from the University of Massachusetts. Mr. Uh, Anderson, includes AI forward slash ML, he'll tell us about that, to identify global, national, regional, and local trends that impact Black, American, and African society to create a sustainable future for us all. Mr. Anderson is an Associate Fellow of World Academy of Art and Science, a Fellow of World Business Academy, and sits on the advisory board of Ethical Markets and Lifeboat Foundation, he is a fellow of the Futures Forum and a member of the National Forum of Black Public Administrators. Blacks in Government, Federal Foresight, Community of Interest, Public Sector Foresight Network, Shaping Tomorrow, TechCast Global, Association of Professional Futurists, World Futures uh, Studies Federation, the International Working Group for People of African Descent, and the Global Future Society, and much, much more. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, take down this PowerPoint, turn it over to Mr. Yul Anderson, who has just come back this week from the Dubai Futures Summit. Hi there. 
Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to speak with you all. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, so I, while we were talking, I don't normally um, put together uh, slideshows. Um, what I do is um, I normally go to uh, websites and put those websites in the chat for you to uh, review and look at. So um, if you don't get a, um, a slideshow presentation from me, uh, don't fret. Um, it's not something I normally do. Um, I want to thank Prophet for inviting me today um, to this meeting. Um, Afrofuturism as in the United Nations, as the title is called, um, what I have been doing over the last five years is galvanizing Blacks around the world, futurists, foresight practitioners, strategists, engineers, scientists, to really engage and talk about the future in more mm, scientific and concrete ways. And most recently, um, we have been faced with and have been introduced to Afrofuturism from the place of Wakanda, as most people have uh, been mm, introduced to mm, science fiction and seeing ourselves in ways that we may never had seen ourselves before, whether that's in art, movies, books, music, you name it. And most recently, we saw Black people in a artificial intelligence produced fashion show produced by Malik Afegbua out of Nigeria. And I will uh, put his LinkedIn. He's a member of our uh, Afro for, for UN. He may join us today. And you have an opportunity to look at what he has produced. But what he did produce were images of Black people in the future that we have never seen before in a way in which it could aspire Black people around the world to a future that they may never have been able to conceptualize. And a lot of us may look to science fiction like Star Trek, most notably. Um, possibly you might have been looking at um, Elysium, which is another movie that has just come out. But again, what we've been trying to do is to bridge the connection with Afrofuturism artists practitioners, singers, with the scientific discipline of foresight and futures research analysis. So that leads me to the discussion that happened in Dubai this past two days. So I flew to Dubai, two days of intensive meetings, and then I flew back to the state. So I had terrible jet lag. But what did I discover when I was in Dubai? Dubai is a city that is roughly 30 years old, and yet it leads the world in architectural design, medicine, architecture, and you name it. And they basically sought to and have created the epicenter of futures foresight thinking around the world. When I left there, I felt really mm, concerned that Black people, because of oppression, racism, just an outright onslaught of an attack on Black progress, not only in the United States, but around the world, that we are pretty far behind. So what was the solution and, and, and how did we come up with the phrase Afro for UN? So because of my participation with some of these global foresight organizations that are run by good old white men, white women, that basically have created a future that benefits them in exorbitant measures, which is why the wealth gap is just as wide as it is. There's an opportunity for Black people to make a presentation at the Summit of the Future in September of 2024 to create a document that truly outlines the demands of what Black people are looking for. With that, we have an opportunity on December 13th to participate and submit a draft document. That link is in the Afro4UN WhatsApp group. But again, before this meeting is over, I'll make sure that all the links I'm referencing are in the chat. And I'm hoping that we 
as a group of inventive, idea-creating Black diasporans, as we may want to call ourselves, can come together and put together a document that is supported by over, in my opinion, I'm trying to get over 2,000 Black organizations to sign on to the document. So you might ask, well, what document are we talking about? How do we create this document? Where is it going to come from? So I've been working with the Canadian Black Empowerment Group, and I will put some of the slides or pictures um, in the chat as well as some links. But in Canada, they were able to garner $200 million for futures research and economic development. And there's only 1.5 million Black Canadians on the entire continent of Canada. So it lets you know that it can be done. It can be done with, um, with cohesion, with, 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 with partnership, with a concerted effort. And I think now a lot of people are questioning whether or not there is a potential future for Black people in America just because of birth rate decline because of just outright attacks on Black people in the United States. And these types of concerns are permeating all the way around the world and are manifesting in different ways and measures. So I will, um, I, I don't know, Prophet, if, you, if I can share my screen, but I do have a small little slide that I could present um, to kind of illustrate the document that I was talking about. Um, and yes, you should be able to because you're co-host. Let me know if you cannot. Okay, let 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 me share my screen here. Um, I think I've got my screen. So, can you guys see my screen? Yes, I think you. Can. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, uh, let me see if I can make it bigger. Okay, great. So, this just a small introduction. Afro for UN African American Future Society. This is going to be the UN Summit of the Future. This is gonna happen in September, 2024 in New York City. There is a preparatory meeting that's gonna be happening in Kenya in May of 2024. And I'm hoping that a lot of you will attend that meeting. This is the document that I'm talking about that we can use as a blueprint. This is the Canadian Black Empowerment Manifesto written by Ryan O'Neill and Errol Gibbs up in Canada. There's over 480 Black organizations that have signed on to this manifesto. I think, however, what we can do, um, because it's well done, um, it's well researched, is we can pretty much look at some of the sections within the document itself and choose and build on, and I have been given the authority to utilize this document for our campaign as it was successful in Canada, so the overview, why do Blacks need, and this of course was what they had put together, why do Blacks need a Canadian Black um, Empowerment Manifesto? And again, as I said, it was very successful for them and they were able to garner $200 million. And then this was their strategy. And I think based on their strategy, always like the Japanese, it doesn't make sense to invent anything if it's already been done for you. You just reverse engineer it and make it work for you. And I think in this instance, this document will be very, very useful um, in, in establishing um, the, the blueprint or the nucleus or the base level of what we may want to present on December 13th. Um, and again, I will make sure you get that. And then we talked about um, how to participate. Um, there will be an Afro for UN website developed very shortly. Um, join the Afro for UN uh, WhatsApp group, um, and you will be able to get a lot of the data that I'm referencing here. Um, and then again, I've got the document up, and you can see it's very well uh, researched. Um, it's, you know, the, what do you want to call it? The, the references and the subject areas are very good. And then within the document, um, they've got some recommendations that I think will be useful for us. Um, if you want to read the entire document, you can. I think it's about 400 pages long. But what I will do is I've already gleaned the document for us. 
and pulled out sections that I think will be useful, but you are more than welcome. I will make all these documents available. Right now, these are in um, Google uh, Groups, and so I will just download them and stick them on a website for everyone to look at and download, okay? Um, but I think this document will be very useful. Um, the other thing that I think will be very useful is um, there is an organization already out there, and it's called the, Co the Coalition for the UN We Need. And I say this to say that right now, COPA 28 is taking place in Dubai, and they're talking about the global planet right now. But at the end of the day, Black people don't emit enough carbons to really impact the planet. So, you know, it... it doesn't seem to be fair, which is why a lot of Black people will be protesting against the meeting. Um, but I, I share this website with you because um, white folks are already carving up the planet. They're already carving up the planet. And I think at the end of the day, um, there's not enough Black folks involved, and I really want us to create something really meaningful. And I think what happens a lot of times is because a good number of us our organizations don't necessarily have the type of capital we need. We jump ship too early and we join white organizations too early and it waters down our intensity and our impact. And so in my mind, I think it's very important that we create a black focused futures oriented document that has black futures in mind. And I just have not seen it. And I definitely didn't see it when I was in Dubai. And um, and then the last thing that I'll show you um, before I leave, and then I'll, again, I'll be typing in the background and doing, um, um, I'll be putting posting links in the, um, in the chat. I just want you to see this. So this is where I was. I was at the Dubai Futures Forum. And it, again, it was the world's largest gathering of futurists and the crown print prints um, of Dubai was at the conference and um, basically gave us carte blanche. And why do I say that? The city of Dubai, and look at this picture here, the city of Dubai, the entire country is focused on building the future. It is infused in everything they do from the government down to the shopkeepers, down to the cleaners, they are moving in lockstep to create the most advanced city the world has ever seen. And they're pretty close to having it done. I do not see this coming from Black people right now. Not in, I don't see it coming from our politicians. I think you guys might even be a little bit um, discouraged. And we need to basically push this country, if not the Black agenda, in a more future-oriented way. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, and I just wanted to kind of share those websites with you. And then the very last one is, if, if I can do this very last one, and the very last one that I have is the UN Summit of the Future. And so uh, this is it. And um, it, it's a real deal. You know, a lot of people might say, oh, what's the future? I don't know anything about the future. Well, if you don't know about it, the world is already planning for a future. And the world is planning for this future with or without your participation. I would like it to be with your participation. And I would like us to go making a lot of noise, making sure that our future is heard. When I was in Dubai, I established four relationships that I think will help us. One, I established a relationship with the Pan-African University in Africa to create a certificate program on futures. The second thing I've done is I created another partnership with the UN Office of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, OECD. They're going to provide us with some futuristic training to make sure that we know what we're talking about in September. Because some of you might say, well, you know, how do I work in the futures? What does that mean? How do I talk future talk? We're going to make sure that you're trained and you know exactly how to say it and when to say it and why you want to say it. The other thing that we worked on the other thing we worked on is we worked on um, some SDG goals, which of course some of you may know. If you don't know, um, this will all be available to you, but this is also part of the future. One of the SDG goals for number 10 is to basically ensure that no one is left behind. And I think a lot of people feel left behind already. 
Um, the other partnership we worked on was with the museum itself, the, the Dubai Futures Foundation. And then the last um, organization we uh, worked with was UNESCO. And so Afro for UN already has an international relationship that I think will catapult us um, into the cadre of um, dialogue and uh, discussion. So that's kind of it um, for right now. Um, I hope that was useful. And then again, um, Prophet, I'm going to step aside. Um, we can take uh, questions later. And uh, here's a document on the scope of the future. And there will be a link that I'll put in on how to participate. Um, and you guys, I think we should do it together as a group, though. I, I, you know, individual institutions are good, but they're not as strong as you know, a, a cell structure where we all come together. And, and so I really would hope that we would all um, come together as a group to participate in this um, document creation, as well as this meeting of the Summit of the Future in September. Thank you. Thank you, you very, I find it very, very exciting. And so I'm very grateful too that you, uh, as I mentioned to the group, as I mentioned to the group, uh, the Afro for UN launch November 2023, which is yesterday. <laughs> so it didn't launch, it didn't launch yesterday, but I'm just saying it's pretty recent. But since that time, you has made relationships with Dubai. So that lets you know in terms of leadership of where we're going. But uh we had another speaker. They're struggling with their internet. And so um they gave their apologies. They're gonna try to get on. But why don't we just start going to questions? Because he jumped into a lot of really heavy duty, deep stuff. Some of you may just know the name and don't know much about uh Afrofuturism. He's covered quite a bit. Let's go directly to questions. I'm sure that that will carry us for the next uh few minutes anyway. Anyone have any questions right out the gate? I have one, um, just from perspective for you. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, in Courtney. regards to yes, something I've been thinking about. Do the hand raise. Let me say this about Courtney, because I failed to do this before. Courtney and I both serve as co-leads for the uh, International Civil Society Working Group that she described. So but anyway, go ahead, Courtney. Uh, that's our role, too, as part of this. I'm sorry. Yeah, and apologies for not raising my hand in terms of No, you're um, good. I just questions. wanted to introduce you appropriately. Yeah, no problem. Um, one question I have, Yule, is for you in terms of um, thank you for this information. And something I'm curious about um, as a younger person is that people are um, predicting for the future, especially with all the, the last few years with COVID and respiratory illnesses of a future similar to what happened in 1918, where many folks are more prepositioned to chronic illness and diseases because life expectancy is going down globally. So I was wondering if that kind of line of thinking came up of how we can use technology and innovation, taking some of the lessons from the last few years, or even beyond that, from disability justice to make sure folks are able to be a part of society versus kind of repeating history a bit, uh, where folks aren't able to participate in events or be a part of civil society because of the ways in which we've alienated folks. Um, and I'm thinking about this in the context of health because... Um, there have been statistics showing that people from 30 to 45 are being more prone to being disabled from COVID. So I am worried about my cohort and my generation of folks who are being coined as another HIV AIDS generation. We might not live as long as our other predecessors. So I was wondering if any of that came up in conversation or if you had any insights from thinking about the future, because that's something that's on my mind about like 2050, 2060 kind of thinking. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Courtney. So um, there was a woman there by the name of Dr. Mary Lou Jepsen, J-E-P-S-E-N, Dr. Mary Lou Jepsen. And I will Google her now and put it in for you. Um, Dr. Mary Lou Jepsen, she has over 200 patents. And she talked about the future in the way that you are talking about, Courtney which is, um, and I'm just gonna put her um, thing in the chat and you guys can look at it. But yes, they talked about demographic shifts. 
and they talked about future health care. And they basically were basically saying that because of the um, low birth rate that America, that the world is seeing, not just America, that the potential catastrophic impacts will possibly wipe out not only certain ethnic groups, but certain countries just because they won't be sustainable. They also talked about they also talked about the need for um, health care. And um, they talked about whew, they talked about um, red light therapy. Um, they also talked about growing um, new uh, sorry, am I answering the question, Courtney? Yeah, sorry, it wasn't me. I, I think it's um, just some background noise. Okay, so I, I just wanted to make sure. Um, they, they, they also talked about um, healthcare in the sense that healthcare will have a double digital imprint in 6G technology such that when you're going to operate on someone, you'll be able to see a total 3D image of that per person's body as well as their internal organs, that that is something that they're creating and bringing on board. The question that, of course, is scaring people is, will that be readily available for them? Or will it just be for the super wealthy? And, and that was the biggest fear that a lot of the young Africans who were there at the conference from the Society of International Development or um, other young Africans from their own NGOs. Basically, we all walked away with a sense of gloom and doom even though we were invited to this international cadre of these super highly, you know, powerful people. Number one, there weren't enough of powerful black American people there other than myself. So I guess I'm powerful, you know, cause I was a black American there, right? But, <laughs> but we just didn't see enough of us to make a difference. And, and unfortunately the wealth gap is so great that if black people stopped spending money tomorrow, no one would blink. Sorry, I didn't mean that to be the definitive statement, but <laughs> it, it's very, very, very frightful. Very frightful. Um, so I put the um, link. Oh, he, um, this appeals here. Great, very great, great. Okay, so I'll, I'll be well, We're going to take a couple questions first, just because I think these questions are based on what you've already covered, and then we will, then we'll oh, okay. sh shift over. Yeah, yeah. That, okay. Uh, uh, I'm trying to. I was trying to pin you in there. I got you pinned, but now I can't see much. So I do see that uh, there's, uh, what is it, two questions? So we have Akil and Dr. Julius. I don't know, Jules, I don't know which one came first because I was shifting a little bit here. She can go first. Jules, okay. Yes, go ahead if anyone wants to ask me another Jill, question. Jules, go ahead. Someone go ahead. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Hi there. How are you? I'm good. Uh, it's nice to see Prophet uh, Yahu and uh, Yul Anderson also. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes. Calling okay. in from Dahomey. Yeah, from Dahomey, from Benin. Yeah. We are on the way. Okay, go Benin. ahead. We, we have, have a, a number, of, yeah, number of questions and then we are at the guests. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, can we have uh, the presentation of uh, Neil Anderson? What he was uh, he's showing us uh, online, and uh, what are the main uh, area that we can uh, move on? Thank you. Yes. Um. Please be a member of the WhatsApp group. I will make sure that I post as many links in the chat of things that I spoke about so that you can, um, you know, you can follow up. And I'm, I'm going to primarily put mostly black people that were at the conference because that is my focus. But I did just send two links, one lady from the World Energy Council. She is the first woman president in over a hundred years. And then I sent the other presentation for Dr. Mary Lou Jepson that I think is very important. And then on the demographic side, I have Professor Alex Eze,
who talked about all the demographics and population and the devastation that's about to happen so that you can personally reach out to these people and, and ask additional questions if you like or ask for additional um, reports or things like that if you want to. But again, I just want to say that... Okay, thank you very much. Yes, yes. And I'm going to send those links to you now so you'll have them. Okay, let's go over to Akil and... Um... Either Courtney or Cecile, can you put the link to join the Afro for you in in the uh, chat again in case new people came in and they missed that? I was trying to find the chat and I'm not finding it on my phone. So if someone else can can put that in there, if not, let me know and then I'll I'll pull it back up. Go ahead, Akil. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, so uh, thank you all. I came on a, a tad bit late, but. Um, one of the things I, I wanted us to think about, and I've been pushing here on my campus, I'm a professor of sociology and African studies at Essex County College in New Jersey, um, and um, is that we have to think about uh, the role of not only AI, but the role of, uh, you know, the next level of supercomputing that's going to impact that. And as we think about uh, Afro futures, that we as African people how do we participate in that and and are in the, the front line of developing it? And where are our children, right? Because the children who are starting to work with AI and say the seventh grade right now are the ones who are gonna be determining what happens in the very near future uh, because the rapid rate at which things are moving and uh, China just uh, had a, um, a thing that came out maybe, uh, a week ago or something like that. They talked about they have a new computing uh, technology for like the internet. They can send 1.4 terabytes in a second over the internet. Now the US doesn't have that, you know, our fastest stuff, at least for public consumption is in the giga, gigabytes. Um, and so what does that mean in terms of our, our participation in or our being left out of the process of this? And I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I did have another question, but I'll, it was really about, uh, um, um, surveillance and things of that nature in relationship to uh, the futures and how, how does that play itself out? But we'll come to that another day. Hi, or sorry, another time. Can, I, can I address that for a second? So um, was that Akil? Yes. Uh huh. So Akil, um, we were very, very, very disheartened to hear that the progress between white children and black children in education in AI, as well as quantum computing, is so far that we, as I, I can just tell you, we walked away in fear. The worst part was Black people are not anywhere near where the, we need to be, not only in AI, but quantum computing, number one. Number two, the number of research scientists in the sciences in America, I think around the world was some, and, and quantum computing, I think they said it was only like 300 people or something. So that we don't have, we don't have a plan of action to counteract any of these negatives. Like for example, I don't know if any city, state, NAACP, Urban League, fraternity, AKA, what Delta, whatever you want to call it, that is producing 1000 doctors every single year. 1,000 roboticists every single year, 1,000, you know, this is the type of game plan that's happening from places like Dubai, India, China, you know, and then yet we get upset, but we don't have a game plan. And, and our plan is, oh, if Johnny or Susie graduates from high school, you know, we're surprised, right? And then if they graduate from college, we're a little bit happier, but we're not directing their future in, in, a, in, a, in a constructive way. And it's very happenstance. And it's not deliberate. And so we are so far behind. And then the gentleman who created quantum computing, and, and if I can, I'll get his name in a minute for you. He wrote a couple of books on quantum. He wrote quantum computing for dummies. And he also wrote a quantum computing book for ages like three to seven. And he said that the next level of, of AI and quantum computing will not even, you won't even need the ability to code all you have to do is go to Alexa because Alexa will be the, the quantum computing magnet and, and the child will 
they'll dictate what they want and the computer will make it happen. And if we don't have Alexa and these types of gadgets in our home for our children, our children are destined to fail. It was a very frightening meeting. It was very frightening. Yeah, I guess I was just also saying that, you know, when you look at the um, ways in which, as an educator, we look at the ways in which school systems are set up uh, in general in the United States, is that the kids are set up to fail. We we tell them don't use compute, don't use their phones, don't use the this, that, and the other. And and we've got to change that m mentality uh, for this. For instance, this semester, I, I did an experiment and I had all my students in my social problems class. I told them they couldn't write their own paper. They had to use AI to write their first draft of their paper in the first two weeks of class. And then they had to come back and, and try to interpret that or to, to expound or to add to it. And so that's the kind of thinking we need to be doing to run to this technology because it's not going away. It's just going to get more and more advanced. And we need to be training our folks to uh, become advanced with it and so that they're partners with its development and on the cutting edge of the development of the, the resource itself. And I think yeah. that's that's my, my main point is that we've got to switch to, to being at the front edge of these things. And, and you know, we have a, a hundreds of inventors. Uh, and so we have to go back to our inventive, uh, uh, innovative uh, point and let that be what Afro Futures to a certain extent is about for us as African people. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. We have we have four more hands up. I, I, really quick, I would say too, uh, uh, Dr. Keel, is that in addition to that, working with the parents, because I have grandchildren with phones, but they won't, don't, they're not looking at what you're talking about. So parents need to understand the phone is not just to call me in an emergency. The parents need to know that there's some benefit as well. So I just threw that in as a little side note, but we have a number of hands up. I think that Cecile was next, or uh, and I see Dr. Lawana and uh, Zainab, is it? as well as Curtis. So Dr. Go. Luana was next. She can go okay. before me. Go ahead, Dr. Luana. Dr. Luana. Sorry, Sabrina, to unmute. Um, first of all, I, I love the presentation and the direction that you're heading in. And I appreciate the call for action. And um, just wanted to, one, um, say that, you know, education is probably one of the biggest focuses that I have in terms of where um, we can make an impact in the future. Um, this year, I launched Green Air as a nonprofit where I'm working to help people understand that, help us understand specifically that we are creating our future, whether we choose to actively engage in it or not. And um, just want to make sure that, you know, that I'm here and that I'm willing to jump in and help however I can. And also, um, one of the things that I've had success with, um, at least locally and in some cases regionally, is gamification and entertainment. I mean, you know, the you, meeting people where they are, especially when you're talking about things like um, the metaverse and quantum computing, helping them understand the practical applications and understand how it can impact and even improve their lives today um, is part of the draw. Um, and the other part, of course, as always, when you think about disparities in education and resources, we have to, um, acknowledge the impact of um, finance and just access to the technology. Um, even now, you know, I'm, I'm an adult and I have a Meta Quest headset, but I can say that when I look at my peer group, even amongst my educated peers, not a lot of them understand the benefit, the value of um, delving into uh, the technology. And then also, I just wanted to throw in that I'm working with a lab at UC San Diego um, to learn how to world build in the metaverse, because the other part is if we want people to embrace it, we have to make sure that there's content that they can um, grab onto that's going to um, be of interest to in them. Mm, mm. You know, um, hi, uh, Dr. Richmond Ewell here, and we're friends, so I'll call you Lawana. How are you? <laughs> You know, it's always good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. You know, th this whole metaverse thing, you know what's even worse? Does anyone realize that was it Microsoft or Apple who collapsed all the metaverses? Do you remember that, Luana? Yeah, it was Microsoft. We actually were, we had we built worlds within that universe and we're using it as a teaching platform. And they sunset it in October 
of um, last year and, and subsequent to that, you know, we've been looking at other platforms. Um, originally, um, I was going to stay away from the meta um, version of the metaverse and stick with um, more, um, the, the Microsoft version was very um, like freeware. And I think that they made the decision to invest in um, AI instead of the metaverse. And personally, I think that there's an application and an argument to be made for um, using AI and the metaverse together in order to world build, especially when you talk about um, future scenarios. Yes, yeah. I mean, I don't know if, if a lot of you um, caught that, but at the end of the day, the moment we're in the metaverse, they pulled the plug. Prideful. All right, I'm sorry. No, that's that, that's fine. We're going we're gonna to move on. But I, I want to say something really quick. This is really quick. Something I observed when I was looking at some of the metaverse and the other worlds, an aha moment I had is that whoever created those worlds is their version of the world. So again, we, we need to have our own. We're stepping into their world and their metaverse. It'd be nice to have one of our own. But mm -hmm. um, Cecile, go ahead. So, boy. <laughs> First, I want to thank you so much for this presentation that you've done. Um, you've just made my mind explode. Um, I'm Cecile Johnson with uh, African Development Plan and someone who has done research on the Black community. And yes, as it relates to us, the data is very grim. Um, I put up two presentations in the chat. One of them is why we need an African Development Plan, where I've looked at comprehensively some of the things that we need to do as we begin to strategize and, and understand what's going on. And another is the presentation on, on the state of Black America, right? Um, it's grim. And, and therefore, when people are out representing us, they need to be able to understand some of the data. So if I can help in that way, that's there. Now, when you just mentioned the moment we got into the metaverse, they pulled it. This is the strategy that's been hitting us for ever since 1452, right? Um, when you look at the Marcus Garvey movement 100 years ago, and the momentum that that had. You're breaking up a little bit, Cecile. You might want to turn your camera off. Um, was. You're breaking up. You might want to turn your camera off. You might get your audio better. She's in Jamaica. Okay, no problem. Uh, yeah, um, we, we need to understand our history. And that's really part of the problem why so many of us have not focused on the future. Uh, it's very hard for people who are barely surviving right, and, and need, meeting their hierarchy of needs to be focused on the future. And so I really appreciate uh, someone like you being in Dubai and sitting at the table and being able to sound that kind of alarm and bringing this information back to us. And if there is some kind of report that's printed from Dubai, we want to read it. I need it as soon as possible, right? And I appreciate the, the links that you have given us, right? As you talked about strategically, what we need to do and the organizations that you identified while you were there. When we, I, I, I'm from Chicago, I'm coming out of Chicago, right? Even though I'm in Jamaica right now. And last year, when we looked at the data concerning the children, uh, math, they were performing at 6%, right? And, and language arts, 12%. And for the fourth year in a row, the ACT scores had fallen for black children going off to college and it was at 17. You know you can't get into college without a 22. So you have seen that the school systems today in the United States are more segregated and they're really practicing apartheid as it relates to education. And that awareness from people like yourself and others as to the state of Black America, as to the data on us, we need more of a sounding board, right? So I, I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, any way that I can help, I, I would like to. Um, I'm concerned that um, AI, I have not really been as interested in it because I'm like, my God, you know, I'm focused on how do the people survive right now? But I really would like to get us to a point where we're not just surviving, that we are allowed to thrive. And I agree perfectly with you, Prophet, when you said the metaverse is built on their, their reality, right? And look at their reality. We have a world of conflict and war. That's not my reality. That's not the reality I want to, to have for the future. So yes, we need to be able to have children. There is a, a program called Destination Imagination um, where they uh, are doing STEM with children. And sponsorship of those children are like $10 or $15 a month. 
These are things that we as community need to begin to be concrete about. You said they raised 200 million in, in, in Canada. Um, where are our black billionaires? Where are our ballers? Where are our entertainers? But that's really where the older money is in, in, in black America, right? It's not really in, in other things like stores that we own and businesses. So how do we engage them? So coming up with some kind of marketing strategy that sounds this alarm, but even though you give, and I say, but uh, 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 an opinion of the future based on what these people um, trying to say are fearful, we've actually moved into a new age. So I wanna tell people that even though some of this looks grim, as we can see with all their technology, it still is the world of chaos. And, and we didn't start the chaos, they did, right? And they continue to be the chaos makers. So as we look forward to the future, I need balance. We need people's skills. And yes, um, children in front of computers and all of that, yeah. But I was watching a little boy yesterday, I went into a store and he was playing um, one of them stores, uh, um, Grand Theft Auto. W what is he learning for the future from Grand Theft Auto, right? So parents, if you are out there and you buy your child technology, please monitor it. And then some of these things you need to be asking yourself, if they don't have any social skills, I don't really care how bright you are from a technological perspective, but then you won't be an evil maniac, right? So um, we need to be able to balance that. What is the black reality? What's the black world? And I don't really care much about how white people put fear in us because they took all of our resources, advanced themselves, and now you want to know why we are where we are. There must be some moderation. There must be some balance and, 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 and a development of humanity um, social skills, people skills, all those other things that have taken us to this point, as well as the technology. So I just want to thank you and thank you to all of those who make comments that I'm bouncing in my head. I look forward to reviewing this later. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cecile. And we're going to go to the next person, but you reminded me of something that a young person I just found out recently and was horrified that there's some game out there that that uh, kids are playing, but the game in the game, there are people or young people committing suicide. And one person, young person had a friend who he has a sister in this virtual world and his sister in the virtual world committed suicide and he was trying to go through and it's just crazy. I haven't seen it, don't wanna see it, but yeah, it's, it's desperately needed. Let's see the, um, I believe that Curtis is next. Hello. Uh, you, when you were saying that you was frightened, I wanted to get a little bit better understanding of what was frightened. Were you afraid that uh, Black people don't have the brain power or something? I'm not sure what, what it did, that frightened y'all, uh, whether uh, we're not using our brains and, and, and they didn't advance in their brain or something. What is it that actually frightened you? Yeah, so... So at the meeting, for example, there was a session with eight astronauts that had spent more than a year in space conducting experiments. We were nowhere in that conversation. The lady from the World Energy Council who was talking about global energy and what's happening with the planet and the atmosphere and the biosphere and the microsphere. We were nowhere in that conversation. The gentleman with the quantum computing who created the books and was talking about the next wave of, of, you know, while I was there, and remember now there were over almost 3000 people there at this conference. And then 10,000 people came the following day for the COPA 28 conference. Out of those 3000 people, I was the only black American male in that grouping. And my urgency is to try to get more of us in this dialogue about talking about the future and being part of the change that's happening on the planet. Now, am I talking about intellectual capacity of Black people? No, I'm just talking about our overall participation on the global stage, whether it's economics, whether it's housing, whether it's education, as we heard from Brother Akil. And, and that is why I'm asking for us today to participate in a concentrated effort to put forward a document that talks about a Black future that we want. Where do we want to see ourselves? 
And right now we don't have a document like that. Even the document on state of the black world that, that um, Cecile, I think, put in the chat or the, or the, the what is that? Um, the United, what is that? NAACP's or United, I forget who, I forget who puts out that document. But even that document doesn't talk about the future. It just talks about a rehashing of, of dead statistics that just talks about our current state. And we don't have a futuristic vision. We don't have any type of idea, ideation of what Black future families will even look like on the planet, which is why we kind of titled this workshop Afrofuturism, because it's going to be through Afrofuturism and science fiction, whether it's movies, print, media, that motivates us to move towards the future, to live in the future, to see ourselves in the future. And all I can tell you right now is the entire Dubai United Arab Emirates, from the crown prince all the way down to the street sweeper, they are in a futures oriented mindset. And that is why their city looks the way it does. And that's why they are going to be the powerhouse that they are becoming. I mean, it's just amazing. And, and here, you know, here, here we have negative growth rates of, of birth. You know, we, we, we've got aging citizens. Um, our politicians don't talk about the future at all. And then when they talk about the future of our children, what future are they leaving us? They're not painting a picture. And so that's why we were not just myself, but most of the black people that attended, we were of, we were concerned. We were very concerned. And, and I'm still concerned, and that's why I'm talking to you this way today, um, to try to stress the urgency that we need to kind of not only change our way of thinking, but we need to come together as a an amoeba of organizations, if you want to call it that. But we need to have at least thousands of Black organizations talking about the future we want. And right now, we're comp we have competing futures. So let me let me throw this in. We have three hands. Uh, we're going to take those three, and then we're going to bring another voice in. That is Miss uh, uh, Yvonne Apio. And um, but I want to do these questions. I also saw in the chat that Cecile mentioned how many young people there are. The biggest population in Africa now are the young people. But I was on a meeting the other day that the population of incarcerated individuals in, in Africa are uh, up to the age of, I forget what age they started, but they go up to like age uh, 35, about 40%. So yes, they have a large number, but that doesn't paint any future picture other than the fact a lot of them are getting incarcerated and may very well increase. So we do need to intervene, not just look at the numbers, but that that is uh, a big, big uh big problem. So we have, uh, and uh, help me, I can't pronounce your name probably correctly, uh, Zanab, Zanab Adua? Uh, yes, it's Zainab Adua. Okay, I got the last part right. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much. I'm speaking from Ghana. Oh, let, let me break in one second. You're 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 breaking. I do a I do a I want to say I do this is a very hold on. I do a I do a I do a there you go. I was gonna ask you to turn your camera off because you were breaking up and sometimes that helps. So go yeah. ahead now. Leave your camera off and go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So I want to acknowledge acknowledge that this is um a very great initiative. Um but um, from where I stand, I see that um, we are very far away from when it comes to AI and even the internet itself, because even in Ghana right now, we still have students in high school who don't even have access to mobile phones, talk less of computers. So I don't know how, how um, far this initiative is going, the extent to which it is um, willing to take in order to make the impact. Because I feel like for this to be um, successful and also sustainable, we would need a, a certain percentage of youth involvement 
which would take a lot of uh, sensitization and public education, not only with the youth, but also, also with the parents, because if um, for a child under 18 years to be able to purchase um, an electronic device like a mobile phone or a computer, it has to be with the support of the parents or in, in agreement for that child to be able to have that um, tool to use. So I don't know, I wanted to find out um, what is the um, percentage or the length of youth involvement in this kind of uh, project or initiative. And how far is it going to the grassroots to reach actually where the change needs to be done? Because I feel like it needs to start from somewhere where they, we need the impacts to take place. Thank you very much. Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, Appeal, are you on? She's, she's on. Yeah, yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, I'm Yes, I am on and I'm just trying to make sure my internet stays because I don't have that good internet. But I'm on, I've been listening and okay. I'm going to try and give you my version of what is going on. Um, but yes, I'm on. I, and, and I just said that because uh, Zanab had um, made a good um, presentation as to how are we going to get the African youth on board. And I know that you've got a position on that. Um, one of the things I can say to you, um, Zaneb, is we have um, African youth organizations that were in Dubai, as well as the May meeting in Nairobi, Kenya, that will try to galvanize civil society in Africa. But the main thing is to have a futures position. And right now, we do not have a position. Zaneb, to me, it sounds like you want to make sure that every child in Africa has access to artificial intelligence, whether that's through Alexa or whatever. And those are the types of recommendations we need to put in the document. So I welcome that. So did you want to uh, uh, jump in, uh, Yvonne? We have Yvonne, uh, and she can pronounce her last name, Brandy uh, Almolo. The other thing is also yeah. her sister, who I don't know if what which is the younger one, but the uh, I think uh, uh, Yvonne is the is the elder sister, but they're both on here, friend. They're both from Kenya, so go ahead um, and uh, let's we can cover that. We have two questions, and we'll come back to Prince Andrew and Jan uh, next. But uh, go ahead while she still has some. Um, hi, I don't know if you can hear me. We can, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you see me? I'm trying to let yes. you see me as well. I don't know. Okay. Yes. We saw you for a second, but um, if you need I, to cut, uh, Yvonne, we saw you for a second, but if you need to cut it off to have good uh, internet for the hearing, we want to definitely, oh, there, that's perfect, but we would definitely want to hear what you have to say, even if we can't see you. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if you want me to introduce myself because I couldn't get the first part of the meeting. Um, go ahead. Uh -huh. Yes. So uh, my name is Yvonne Apio Brendley Amolo. I am a Kenyan and I'm Swiss as well. I'm a member of parliament in Switzerland uh, and I'm studying, I'm doing my PhD on politics, gender and diversity and technology. So I'm big on the youth. I also just started something called the European Minority Parliamentary Caucus, where I bring together members of parliament who in Europe, who um, represent the minority it's going quite well. So I actually now may have to change the name at the end from European Minority Parliamentary Caucus to Interparliamentary Caucus because I have members from the Black Congressional Caucus in the States. I have the Black Canadian Caucus. I'm right now in Kenya and next week we will sign a memorandum of um, understanding with the Kenyan parliament. They want to be, they want to form a sister caucus to work with us. Now, why am I mentioning this? We have two programs. One is peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, parliamentarian to parliamentarian. Two is mentor to mentee, where we take the youth or any other member of the public who would like to learn uh, public policy, uh, human rights, and uh, politics. Now, I'm currently in Kenya, and I'm glad I'm currently in Kenya because I had forgotten how much passionate the youth are about technology. Yeah. So, yes, I, I really would like us to get the youth on and I will that will take me back to uh, the next thing I want to talk to you about. Like you already mentioned, there is going to be a future summit uh, 
done, organized by the UN. And this uh, future summit is going to take part in Nairobi, Kenya. I, I was glad they chose Nairobi, Kenya. And I was there already for the pre preliminary meeting for civil society at the UN in Geneva. And I can read out the, the about nine, 10 points they wanted to concentrate on because I took notes of that so that you know what the future summit is going to look like. The future summit is basically concentrating on what our futures will look like. I did challenge them and they agreed that they have to get the youth on board, especially since like somebody pointed out in the notes that um, Africa has the youngest, youngest uh, population and our population mainly consists of the youth. You know, so if we leave the youth out, we're basically leaving out Africa. Now, the nine points that they say they would like uh, for the future summit is one, to account for the future. We need practical steps to take account um, of the long-term impact of our decisions and fulfilling long-standing commitments for all the member states. So those are all the member states of the UN, yeah? And they have to make a certain commitment to future generations, which is actually the youth. So we see already from the first point, we are trying to have the youth on board. Number two, better response, better respond to global shocks. We've had quite a number right now. We're talking about the Gaza. We are talking about the war in, in, in Sudan. We're talking about Congo. Yeah. And we, we need to put in place a stronger international response or playbook for complex global shocks, maximizing the youth the use, sorry, of the Secretary General's conveying power in form of an emergency platform. Now, I was in another, um, I was in another conference here in 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 Kenya where I was trying to tell them the title of our talk was African Solutions to Global Problems, which means Africa right now. And we had quite an international audience, but it was mainly also an African audience or a people of African descent audience also, because we had some people from, from the Caribbeans also here. And we all agreed we would like to provide solutions to people of African descent because we cannot wait for the Western uh, solutions. Like you already said, if we do that, they, they just leave us out. So we transformed this part, not just to say maximizing the use of the Secretary General's conveying power in form of an emergency platform. We were talking about how about we form our own emergency platform because every time we wait, it will happen just like you will say that people like you or me will be the only person in such white spaces. Three, meaningful include meaningfully include young people. So we need to systematically, yeah, systemically and also with purpose, intentionally include young people in global decision making. Now, that is why my caucus also concentrates on this, because if we already take the young, the youth under our shoulder and they, they shadow maybe politicians, they learn human human uh, rights, they learn public policy, then they know from a young age what they need to do. They learn from some of our mistakes and they know how they need to go on with, with, with being better futures, uh, be better future leaders, better decision makers. And then meaning, um, the, the next one, number four, sorry, measure human progress more effectively. Because usually when they do measure human progress, it's from a very Eurocentric or a West-centric uh, lens. It's from a white gaze. And they don't know how to measure progress in terms of uh, people of African descent. Yes, like you'll say at the moment, when you consider how far they are with the metaverse, with AI, we are nowhere near. But when you think about it, I'm also in another group, which is um, an African uh, US, tech group, they had their first meeting on tech uh, last month. I didn't know about it. And they want to have a second one in January. When I listen to the things they discuss, they're organizing hackathons. They're organizing how to teach children coding on computers for free. And I know that in these are uh, scientists in, in, in Ghana, from Ghana who works for one of the universities in, in Switzerland. He was already teaching coding in Ghana when he realized that some of the laptops that had been donated, they would die off in the middle of the teaching for the students and the lecturers. So what he decided, he sat down and came up with a way of teaching coding on your phone because he realized that most people, most, most people here, 
in Africa have phones. When they don't have phones, they can maybe get easier access to a phone than a laptop. So he's teaching coding on the phone. So those are, we need more innovative ideas, how to reach our youth, how to reach our people. And then by measuring a human progress more effectively, what they, what they wanted to, to do is agree on metrics of the GDP so that decisions on debt relief, decisions on, on, on consensual funding and international cooperation take account of the vulnerability and the well-being, the sustainability and other vital measures of progress. This is where we come in. We need to have voices that are there telling them you, you can't leave us behind when you're talking about uh, taking account of vulnerability because our our way of being vulnerable is very different from when you compare it to the, to the Western world and when you compare it to everybody else that is not black and brown, you know? And then number five, agree on a vision of digital technology. And here comes in exactly what Yul was talking about, that we need to have a handbook. We need to have something that everybody is following that talks about what kind of future will we black and brown people have. If we don't have something that we are submitting to them, they will not listen to us. We have to be prepared. So as a motto for human progress that can deliver full benefits while minimizing potential harm. That's what they were talking about. But if we prepare ourselves a bit better, then we can give them what our demands are, what we expect, what we see for our futures. Number six, commit to integrity in public information. Now we need to insist on this because sometimes I think, and I feel, not really I think, I feel sometimes we don't have the information, not because we are not interested and not because uh, we don't want to get into these spaces. We need to find a way of accessing these spaces so that we, we have um, integrity to this public information. And this, when they discuss it, they were talking about achieve an information ecosystem, yeah, notably online. And when they talk about an information ecosystem, if we are not there to insist that they include us in this information ecosystem, of course they won't. And they say this ecosystem has to be inclusive and safe for all, and perhaps via a code of conduct. These are all things that were decided by the UN for the next summit. That's why I would like you to pay some attention. Number seven, reform the international financial architecture to ensure that it delivers more effectively and fairly for everyone, and particularly the global South, including through objectives that are aligned with the SDGs, debt sustainability, and the global financial safety net and more. Number eight, uh, advance the peaceful and sustainable use for outer space. You already talked about that, and he said it was scary to find out how advanced they are with going into outer space. Now, here, when we talked about it, we were talking about updating the norms governing the use of and the behavior in space so that it is peaceful, secure, and sustainable for the benefit of all. Again, I will insist the only way it will, it will be that if more of us make sure we take part in this future summit that is coming to Nairobi, because here they say civil societies will be able to take part, the youth will be able to take part, they will make it more accessible for everybody, the different governments will be able to take part, they should send delegates. It is still early enough that you can make sure that your NGO, your civil society, that members of your of, of your youth from different countries can find a way of being brought here. I will give you the dates of the summit when I finish, but let me go on. Number nine, agree on a new agenda for peace. Now, here we were talking about updating our understanding on all forms and domains of threats and adapt our toolbox to prevent and manage hostilities on land at sea in space and in the cyberspace. That is very important for us to keep to, to keep in mind because we have a way and with this, we could try and even affect the world that are going on. We're doing a lot of protests and all of that with a lot of pressure, but we need to try and tap into some of these some of these agreements that we decided, some of these points that we decided at the UN to be able to, to be more effective at um, agreeing on the new agenda for peace, especially in the cyberspace, especially in space itself. Number 10, 
transform education. That is very important for us because like you all mentioned that our children are not getting the same access that the, the, the white children, the Caucasian children are getting to all this to the, all this education. We need to look into that and achieve a fundamental shift in how education is seen and treated, including in relation to the purpose of education. Why is this education being, being impacted? Why are our children being left out? The learning environment is also something we need to look into. The teaching profession, we have professors who can teach this. We just spoke to one and I will use her, her first name, Lawana, since we are friends. And she has, and I and other people have a very easy way of teaching about Afrofuturism because we know how to use the, the, the science fiction. We know how to use stories. We know how to use movies to teach you exactly what Afrofuturism, and I will come back into that, what, what it really means and how we can use it to, to our own benefit and good. Um, we need to harness the digital transformation investing in education and multilateral support for quality education for all. In the African diaspora, in every chat I am in, we keep talking about how we would like to invest in education for our children so that our children are not left behind. We see that this education is not given to our children in the normal schools. We need to build uh, forums and platforms where we can give this education to our children ourselves. We can't keep waiting that they will help us with it. Now, number 11, the last one, the UN 2.0, which is adapt basic UN practices on data, communication, innovation, strategic foresight, performance and results, and more so, so it is better positioned to support all of the above and face the challenges of tomorrow. Like I said, all the member states signed in on this and they may also elect people to come. It is not yet complete. It's, it is a pact of ideas that were put together. So they're still accepting proposals of pact of ideas from um, member states, they're um, accepting that from civil societies, from NGOs, or even just groups that have something to say. And you can send those um, pacts and information proposals, ideas to the Secretary General's high level advisory board. And I have the address which I can send later on to everybody else. And this is the board on effective multilateralism. That is what we talked about for the upcoming uh, future summit in Kenya, which will be from 22nd to 24th of September, 2004 in Nairobi. Okay, so that is, um, that is what I have to say about the Future Summit. Um, I will take questions on that before I go into Afrofuturism and how we can use it. We had two questions that were up. Uh, why don't we, uh, we may have to kind of combine some of those two that were already out there. Can we go ahead and, and take those and then uh, either one of you can, can jump in. And actually, I think there was, um, Jan, you put your hand down. Did you no longer have a question or... And then there's Andrew and Effie. Are you still on, Jan, or did you need to jump off? I'm here. Thank you, Prophet. Um, I just wanted to affirm the concentration on space. I've been very concerned that we do not have any of our youth involved in the Mars generation. This country is going to Mars. It's just a matter of time. If NASA had all the money that they had, if they needed, we would be going to Mars any day now. And so I just wanted to affirm that I'm very pleased that space is part of this conversation. Thank you so much, Prophet. Okay, thank you so much for being here. And so we have uh, Prince Andrew, you're on. Well, thank you so much. And thank you. This is, I believe, the most important meeting I've ever been involved with. So thank you so much for bringing it to our attention. <clears throat> I do want to um, let you know or remind you all that the African Union's Agenda 2063 does include space. There are 12 flagship projects. But you will, I'd like to ask you, you said that you were the only Black American at that event. Were there any um, Blacks from Africa or the Caribbean there? Um, yes, um, let me let me say I was the Black American male. <laughs> okay. there, there might have been a Black American female, but I didn't recognize her, and I know most of the futurists. Um, there was a Caribbean, I think I mentioned in the chat, Dr. Claire Nelson was there. Uh, she's from Jamaica. Um, she has created the Caribbean Heritage Month, and she and I worked together on a lot of um, ideas. And then there was Ingrid Lafleur, she's from uh, D 
Detroit, I believe. She now lives in um, South Africa. Um, she is was the Black American female that that I'm aware of. Um, the uh, the link to the, the 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 Dubai Futures Forum I will put in the chat right now, and you can um, you know look at the website if you'd like um, at your leisure. Um, but you you'll get a chance to see the cadre of people who were there. So I thank you for that, uh, Andrew. Well, you're welcome. Actually, it was just a lead in. I don't know to ask whether um well first of all to give recognition and appreciation to the work done by the African Union. While we talk about the sustainable development goals, it's important to understand that that's just the second iteration of the Millennium Development Goals. And mm -hmm. it was a common African position that was developed as part of the lead up to the African Union's Agenda 2063 that allowed Africa to have the largest con regional contribution to what we now know as the sustainable development goals. However, they do have a 50 year plan. And I'm just curious or uh, asking us to be as futurists to be the ones to come up with a 50 year plan for black America and for Caribbean Americans that aligns with the existing African American agenda 2063. So we have a co cohesive global outlook from this because we are not just Africans, we're also Alcabulans, which means that everyone on earth is part of our DNA and we must tap into all of those resources for our common objectives. But in the chat, I did put a link to the what's generally known as the, again, the 12 flagship projects, including space. But if we pull together Afrofuturism, with this attitude towards looking to space, to me, that is, in fact, the, the best pathway we have to engage our youth, who are actually, uh, as part of the Ed Food Foundation, Afronauts, the ability to have our stories being told in narrative manners that engage the wider population but we have to control the evolution of this through, I agree with you, a collective effort on our part. So I would just suggest that this group be the one to take a lead in that. What I'm speaking from is a perspective as a futurist myself. There is an organization called the Global Business Incubation, GBI, that was founded in 1991 on the campus of Loyola Marymount University. It was <clears throat> the president and vice president are of African Americans, but it was founded on the blueprints created by Dr. George Katzmetsky, who's known as the father of Silicon Valley, among other things. But these blueprints were developed specifically to engage the African American community worldwide. <clears throat> but the founders, again, have either died or retired. So there's infrastructure and blueprints in place, but they need population and personnel to put them into use. Thank you. I'm sure there are people on this call that would love to take you up on that, me included. <laughs> Andrew at Andrew Networks. I'm findable anywhere. All right. Francis, did you put your you put your information in the chat? Multiple times. Okay, and you. I also know that you're part of the Afro for uh, UN group. I'm so glad that you joined, and you mentioned Edfu Foundation, who was also the uh, fiduciary for. Um, the International Civil Society. So thank you for that for that linkage. I will put in the chat again. Um, anyone interested in joining the Afro for You and uh, WhatsApp group right now? And it will become a website, but right now you can actually join and be connected with uh, others who are involved in this work. And then we'll go to Effie. Uh, up before I leave, uh, this shows that we're we're streaming on Facebook, but I'm not finding a way where I can access that or make it available. Also, I want to ask us if we can find a way to syndicate this communication so that we can further engage it and also use AI to make the transcript of this available in languages other than English, as there are a minimum number of official languages for the African Union. If we're seriously talking about working together on a global scale, we have to take the initiative to be able to engage in all those areas of communications that are relevant, in my personal opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Prince Andrew. And I think that's a grand idea. The struggle is the uh, uh, semi-illiterate, I'm not totally illiterate now, semi-illiterate person who set this up, who I just clicked AI because I saw something that said AI. But yeah, there's a there's a long way to go, but I am so glad to be a part of this. And, and that's why I mentioned to Akil, 
you know, reaching the young people is critical, but the parents need to know somebody's got to work with the parents so they'll know the kids shouldn't just be playing games and keep them busy so that they could do other things. That it needs to be really a collective thing. The other thing, and I don't know what uh, you or you or Yvonne think about this, but even in terms of the work we do around resistance for racism and all that, I just think we put I won't say too much, but there's a lot of energy that goes into things that we seemingly can't change. I think there's some more we could use our energy, uh, or at least split it up and make sure that we're getting enough in this area and not just on, on those other things. But that's a personal opinion. Effie, go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Effie Baldwin, and my background is in psychology and counseling, and I've worked with the federal government in Washington, D.C., so there's a lot of information that's been tossed around and data. So, but what I haven't heard is the foundation. I am not surprised that we are where we are. It was planned and it was strategic and things have turned out exactly as they were supposed to given the history of the United States. However, as we start this planning process, we haven't looked at the basics, which is the foundation of people of African descent, which is our families. The data on female head of household, that has an impact. The data that women make less than men, and the other part of that is that African-American women are at the bottom of that. So, you know, if if we don't have that foundation, it's like we're talking about the cut, the picture of the shutters on the house, yet we haven't talked about the foundation being sand. So, there's a lot to do, you know, and we take as many approaches as we can. We look at the things that we can deal with strategically in a year, five years, but also too, there's babies that are being born since this initiative just started now. Look at what do we want for those children born in 2024? Yeah, you know, we know that children need to be reading proficiently. And I say, and a lot of other people do, two grade levels above where they are. And this is a parent issue. You know, we, we have to be in there to support the African-American household and family so that they can have the financial resources. You know, education ties into your zip code and your zip code ties into the money that you're able to afford in a house or apartment when you have 50% of Americans living in an apartment, which means that's not stable. They're going to be moving every time the actual um, rent goes up. So all there's a lot of factors that tie into what we're doing. So we're not looking at how do we stabilize households where mothers and fathers are actively engaged as the primary educators of their children. I don't care what the world teaches. They can teach whatever they want, but my children will be educated by me. That's what we need to understand. And I did that. I supplemented my children's education. I flew out to California to teach my granddaughter to read before she went to school. I'm like, nah, y'all not going to get, you know, you're not going to get my children. So we have to look at how do we support the family? And that is mothers and fathers. I'm saying it. Get mad if you want to. We didn't get these children here by ourselves. We didn't lay down and get pregnant by ourselves. You know, so we need to look at that so that we make sure that structure is in place so that children can live in a household that has the resources, whether they're in the right zip code or not, so that they can have the educational foundation that they need. That's just the beginning, mm -hmm. you know? So all of it, you know? So I think we do need a comprehensive plan. And someone mentioned Mars. I worked at the Department of Education, the, the, sorry, Department of Agriculture, when we finally figured out how to grow green leafy vegetables because they put a lot of the stuff in front of us. Mar the movie Martian was put out. The reason why you need to be able to grow your vegetables is because we're not going to be able to have life on Mars if we can't feed people and it takes us so long to get them food. So agriculture and NASA have been working together for years. So it is a 50-year plan, you know? Um, and so we need to break that out to say, what can we do now? And how do we start from 2024 for every child that is born? What type of future do we want for them? Thank you. Yeah. Could, could I just add Effie? Um, Sorry, this is you. Oh, it's hey, okay. Effie. You go ahead. 
Yeah, Effie, you are absolutely spot on with that. And within the manifesto that um, I'll be putting on the um, links as well as on the Facebook page, I mean, as well as on the website, there is a whole committee on the future of the family and what and should and how should that look? Because right now, as you know, with quote unquote uh, population and statistics and fathering and mothering, there are not enough men to go around and there may not be enough one man per one woman type family structure in the future. And we really have to look at what the future of the family looks like. Um, so I welcome that and just add that. And, and I will be placing that in the, um, on the, on the webpage, um, in the manifesto, there's a whole section on the future of the family, a whole section that I think you'll enjoy. Can I jump in okay, as I'll well, just, add... just, just to be able to, um, um, hold on a second. I, well, I want to just jump in really quick, the, um, just to say when the future of the family, like everything else, let's keep, you know, re, uh, be open to different models. I've been a uh, head of household since 1979. I've lived in apartments since 1987. I am an apartment kind of person. I need to call maintenance because I, you know, <laughs> I just need to call maintenance if I need something fixed. So that's what that is. I also have certain beliefs about owning a home because if I miss my taxes, they're going to take it. I don't know that like, you could ever own in the United States. That's just my cynicism about it, but that's what I do. So just being open to the fact. And also I have family members who one is very poor, but she did homeschooling. One has quite a bit of resources. School kids were in so-called good schools, but they still have a hard time and they don't learn that much. So just kind of not to put it, you know, and I haven't read it, you or, or Effie, but just to stay open, I'm single parent, have been, will be till I die, whatever. So there are models out there that, that uh, but I'm here in this Afro, uh, thanks to you and Yvonne, because uh, when I first heard about it, I wasn't interested in it. So just know that, 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 the idea that single moms and the can't do. And so my children and grandchildren and great grandchildren are now learning because of me, the single parent who loves apartments. Cause when I get ready to do something, I don't want to have to call, I want to call maintenance. So that's just maybe my low level of thinking, but I'm not interested in paying taxes that if I can't pay them, they're going to take my property. So, and when the rent goes up, I don't leave. So I'm just saying, so let's just kind of stay open in terms of, um, in terms of who people are in these spaces, there are a lot of single mothers and I'm not looking for someone else to pay my rent or do any of that stuff. So just just know that. So that's just my little personal side note. I think uh, Yvonne, you wanted to jump in with some comments. Yes, I'm, I'm just gonna try and put off my, my, I don't know, I'll try and put off my camera at some point. But yes, I wanted to jump on with some comments and say, I, I haven't, I didn't give my presentation, which I would normally give on um, Afro-future feminism, just so that you know that the women are not forgotten in this in, in this talk and the women are central in our in our futures when we look at it because um afrofuturism the way we understand it here in africa is really centered on the family and it doesn't matter whether your 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 idea of the family is a nuclear family it doesn't matter whether your idea of the family is the lgbtqia plus that somehow have a child it doesn't matter what your idea of the family is, but it's family centered, it's family centric, and it has to have a child in it. Now, we also have to understand that the Afrofuturism movement was really mainly pushed forward and made that famous by women, by black women. You know, we are the center of this because we take our time to learn all of this and Afrofuturism -future, feminism is different from the other kind of feminism because like I mentioned, we center it on the family and we don't only center it on the family, it's a movement, it's an artistic movement that has the ability to go and look at the past, the wrongs that were done to us in the past, look and try and correct that, the future, look at the present, what, what, what's going on right now and how we can sort that out and try and give a better future 
to our children. That's why I love this Afrofuturism movement so much because I don't know any other movement that is so positive, that gives hope to our future. That's why I cling on to this movement, you know? And this movement has more than just uh, sci-fi in, in it. It's not just about science. And when you look at the science, actually, some people say it's only about science and only going into space. But when you look at, for example, the movie, uh, Black Panther was written by a black woman. You know, the script for that movie was written by a black woman. But some of the things that you see in Black Panther that everybody thinks is fiction and imaginary. We do have some of those things and we do believe in that kind of, of, of medication and that kind of healing in Africa. We still believe in that. Some of you may think it's far-fetched, but we do believe in connecting with our ancestors, in our ancestors coming down and speaking to us. We still pray to our ancestors and we do things guided by our ancestors. We heal ourselves with our ancestors. I love the fact that the second version of Black Panther also incorporated Operated the Latin America because we cannot do this alone. We really cannot do this alone. We cannot afford to leave our other black and brown brothers and sisters behind in this movement. It's only together that we will achieve what we really want to achieve, you know? And when you really, it looks like it's just some cartoon and fictional movie that wants to get everybody away. You need to sit deep into this and see what they are doing. In these movies, they go into space, but who goes into space? It's the black and brown people who go into space. And in these movies, they actually, in a weird way, make fun of the Western society that are trying to steal our knowledge, which we already have, which we have grown up with. If you really think about it, it's just saying we need to tap deep into our natural resources, stuff we were practicing for many years with centuries that they are just coming into knowing right now. We just need maybe more to tap into our finances, come together with finances and open this portal, this door. But we have the resources among us if we do come together to even surpass this knowledge because some of us, we have this in us, we don't even necessarily have to learn all of this from fresh. They have to learn it from us. In fact, most of the times they come and steal this knowledge and sell it back to us and try and teach it to us. But we have it already. We are at the source, you know? So like Afrofuturism, an example of some of the ways we try to correct past wrongs is in the States, in New York, I have to dig it up because I don't have, unfortunately, it was on my computer and I can't seem to get my computer and my phone to work on internet at the same time. But there was a whole exhibition on black women's bodies, you know, just to give a positive uh, expression of our body shapes. And the person who did it, the exhibition, she also went as far as telling about uh, Sarah Batman, who was a South African woman from the Khoi, uh, um, the Khoi tribe in, in, in South Africa. And she was exported to France. She was told she was going to get a really good job there. But, um, but she didn't, she didn't. She ended up being put on exhibit, on exhibition, because she had a body shape that was very different that the Western world had not seen at that time. And she died while being just taken from country to country, city to city, being exhibited just so people could see her from all ways, shapes and forms, because she had the same kind of booty that Kim Kardashian is now paying good knows what kind of money for to try and get. And it's after Sarah Batman was put on exhibition that the English, it's also in my in the presentation I wanted to show, the English started making their, their dresses really differently and putting more padding towards the back so that they would have the same kind of shape that Sarah Batman had. They nicknamed her the Black Venus. You can look her up as well. Um, I'm very glad I was also in the talk I gave yesterday, I was being asked by the Kenyans whether during reparations, we could ask for some of our Mau Mau heroes' remains to be brought back and whether that would be accepted. And my answer was, uh, South Africa fought for so long to get the remains of Sarah Batman, and they did eventually before Mandela died. They were able to get the remains back. We can get the remains of our, of our, of our heroes. We can ask for where they were buried. They can be brought back. So this exhibition was showing how we should celebrate our bodies. And Afrofuturism is showing, they, they have used stereotypes that make us hate our bodies. And yet they're now 
putting the same things in their lips and in their backsides just so they can look like us. We should celebrate our bodies, you know? We should understand, we should take back our own narratives, learn that what we have is not necessarily evil or bad. This is what Afrofuturism is trying to teach us. Tap into our knowledge and just use it for our futures. But we also need to write that down because we have realized when we don't document all of this stuff, they steal it and come and give it back to us and saying this is what we came up with. They didn't come up with this stuff. We did, you know. So I'm big on digital documentation. We're working on that as well. I'm big on digital do documentation. Kenya is trying to write down a list of, of, of the things that were stolen by the British because they don't have that. They're working on that so that the, using this digital documentation, we can ask for some of our rights back, but also using this di digital documentation, we can protect the things that we have, but also digital documentation like you did. We have a handbook, we present it. These are the things we need. Don't leave us behind. And all those spaces that you, you close the doors to us should be open to us. So yes, women will not be left behind. They are the main core, the backbone of this movement and we shall keep it like that. Sorry if, if, if I was, I went into a tirade, but I'm, I'm just so passionate about this because you, you may be able to hear and to feel. Thank you. Thank you so much. The, um, and we have, uh, we have about 10, 15 minutes left. And if someone needs to uh, jump off right at the top of the hour. We want to keep it at two um, minutes. I want to thank uh, Yvonne for her comments. I agree with that. Uh, and I've spoken to Yvonne and you all about the fact that I've, I see, and, and everyone hopefully is seeing themselves in this space of Afrofuturism. It's very mm -hmm. broad. I'm interested in the healing and the spiritual peace. Part of my uh, what I'm seeing as I watch some of these activities is that a lot that's happening out there in the metaverse and some of these other spaces that I and some others who I know have experienced them inward. So uh, you all, I thought I would I would have a uh, metaverse within or something, you know, but uh, uh, you'll insist that I bring science to it. So I am working on it. Trust me on that, that, that many of those spaces and places that people want to get on ships and go, I've seen some of them within. So just throw that out. It's sort of a weird thing because the whole thing can sound a little weird. But anyway, we have about, I'm going to the people who haven't spoken yet it's because we only have a few minutes left. And so I see um, Nelson and Keturah and then Akil, depending on the time, I'll come back to you. But let's go to Nelson first and then Keturah. Right. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I, I must say this is incredible. Uh, I'm glad uh, my brother, Professor Akil, sent this uh, to me, I just saw it while I was at work. I like I needed to jump in um, to to hear this. Um, irrespective of what it is, once it comes to being African, uh, we all have to put our resources together. And when I say resources, I mean time, money, and intellect. Incredible discussions have been going on. Uh, but I must say this: that those who will be prepared for the future that's coming are those who understand utilize the tools that come with the change that the future brings. So for us as a people, Black, or all those of African descent, to be in that future that we talk about, then we must be prepared for that future today. However, we must understand the tools, adopt the tools, and utilize those tools so that we can get into the future and be relevant in that future. Uh, there's a common saying, uh, that, that that we all say back home, I'm Nigerian by, by, by extract, um, that no matter how bad the drought is in the forest, the lion would never eat grass, period, because it's genetically built to hunt. Now, for those of us who are preparing our children for that future, we must teach our cubs how to hunt to the, for that future. Because if we do not, then we are in deeply troubled. And why do I say this? Because we must understand the change that's coming, the technologies that's out there. And unfortunately, like I will always say, and some of you have heard me say that, the future is here. It's just that it is not evenly distributed. And what does that mean? Meaning those of us who are color are not in those spaces. So what do we need to do? We need to be intentional. We need to be objective and plan adequately. 
And to do that, I have talked about three pillars for racial dominance. And I'll say this quickly so that we understand and, and then we'll close up and then we'll follow up with each and every one of us. Um, I'm already working on a book. It's called The Three Pillars of Racial Dominance. I call it the three M's of racial dominance. One is money, two is military, three is media. Now money we don't have as a people because we're 233 years behind the onset of money as a black, as a black race, I'm sorry. Now the second one is military. We need the money to buy the military. We don't have that. And we see what's going on all around. Now the third one is media. And that's the only space that we have a chance in attaining. And for those who are, for those of you who are paying attention, you see what Afro music, Afro beat is doing around the world. The, the reselling of our trademarks, our food, our culture, our music around the world, and everybody's adapting it. So using that tool is great and we must expand on that. However, we must also pursue the other two M's. And how do we do that? Because the Chinese understood that. And what they did first, they went after the money. And we see what they've done with that. And with the money, they're buying the military and they're buying media. Huawei, YouTube, all of these things, TikTok, we see what they're doing. And that's why the America, the Amer America and the West is pursuing that as a matter of fact. So if we have to get the things we need to do, we must be intentional and we must strategically align ourselves. Like a brother said, I think it was, you know, Anthony, that we must align ourselves with the with the principles and rules that have been set aside with the 2020, 2063 agenda of Africa. And understanding that, listen, for one Africa to move forward, all of us has to move forward. The dichotomy that has been put behind us between Africa and African-Americans, we need to break those barriers. And we use the internet, we use the social media to collect each and every one of us so that we can achieve those aims. But again, before I close, we must be strategic and pursuing those three ends of racial dominance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nelson. I don't know if you're aware you. that Russia uh, signed some agreements to build nuclear power plants in Africa. So yeah, we're behind that a little bit. We'll jump over to Katura and uh, uh, Yul and Yvonne, if you can prepare, wrap up work, you know, kind of wrap the whole thing up after we uh, do this next uh, two questions. What's the next steps? Uh, we've been putting uh, the um, link in the chat throughout this this uh, session, uh, so anyone who wants to join the for the Afro for UN can do that. That's one way. I know that you can keep up with what our next steps are. But uh, if you want to wrap things up, let's just go to Couture and then wrap up with uh, Akil if we have a, a minute. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning. Peace and blessings. Um, I just want to. Just thank you, um, Sister Prophet, for um, you know letting me be aware of this, and I did share it with as many people as I as I could. Um, it, this is a lot to take in, and I keep saying to myself even to just breathe, because you know the focus of what I am doing is around the foundational stuff, as the sister talked about earlier. And as uh, the brother talked about in reference to our health. And so my foundational piece is that of us figuring out a way or honoring the way that we come together, which is what the Zola experience is about, is about that first level of healing that we must do. Because in order for us to do all of what you all are talking about, we have to love each other, trust each other, honor each other, and and. and come together and move as a unit. And we all know that when we have worked in corporate, they do all these team building things, team building things. Well, because of our experiences globally, we have to come together and do our team building. And, you know, I am committed to do what, what I have, what I truly believe is my divine mission to put this out there and to continue to do it globally and some people say that's a little ambitious no it's not because what is futurism futurism is thinking past what is real what is here today and we have to think past what is here today and as you, you said we continue to be putting out this these 
dire statistics about our community, but we don't put out the, the statistics or the information that highlights our strengths. We have to come from a strength-based mentality because that other side keeps us depressed. That other side wants to make us numb. That other side wants to make us anxious that we're not going to catch up, that we're not going to be able to do this. When we get in touch with our genius, the brother talked about it. We are, we are it and they know it. So when we embrace our genius, then it is on, we are doing it. it, it we will surpass whatever it is that's out there because they stole it from us from the beginning. They understood our genius. They suppressed our genius as, as best as they could, but still we rise. But where we are today is that we have to embrace each other and move forward together. And the only way that we're going to do that is to understand our trauma, understand that we have all of it, all the tools that we need to do to heal from this experience and to walk in lockstep, as the brother said, with the energy of love, with the energy of honoring our ancestors so that we can do the work that we were put here to do. So, you know, I will be on that website. I will go and follow up with the sister that has the piece about health and whatever else it is. I'm going to stay in my lane. I don't know anything about quantum physics, but I do as a licensed clinician, I do understand health and wellness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katura. I know much about your great work that you're doing and that you'll be doing some in Thailand. That's why, thanks to you all, you know, I am, uh, my launch will be the metaverse within. <laughs> because it's also spiritual and healing. We all have to take our place, but I do believe that we all have a place in this. And so our last person is uh, Akil, and then I'll turn it back to uh, Yul and uh, and uh, to talk about, and the, the, join the uh, afro for un group. And that's a start in terms of putting as many of us as possible in one space and then uh, working very fast. Like I said, this, this was launched uh, November, 2023 yesterday but a few weeks ago and it will continue to go at that speed i mean within a matter of a couple of weeks we have our name now over in the uh in dubai i'm just so impressed and, and you you mentioned rather quickly about training so you can bring everybody up to speed even if you're not working in the quantum space but you want to be able to come as an afrofuturist doing your thing you know everybody um you know, there are many gifts and many, many uh, abilities, but we need them all and we need them all to be futuristic so that we are working toward knowing. Um, uh, let me I'll take a second to do this. It's kind of from my world, my spiritual world, because I do meditation a lot. Earlier this year, I had a sort of a vision kind of thing. And in the vision, or tra I mean, not, not like in visualizing, but just sort of a premonition that in 300 years, China will be known as the land of the Chinese. Someone said that's impossible, but then when I thought about it, we talk about Kemet. Kemet that didn't look centuries ago like it looks now. You know, the noses were not knocked off and the mouth was not deformed, whatever. So it is possible if someone is strategic to do the same thing. It sounds like it's impossible to just look around the world. A lot of places are not what they would have been thousands of years ago. So if we uh, my belief is if we can't see it, we can't have it. So all of us, this is, is sort of a, a, a call to action uh, to be able to do that in whatever space we do it in. I can't do it quantum either. I don't know, but then quantum is spiritual. I mean, Einstein, but anyway, I won't ramble on about that. I'm going to turn it over to, oh, we have one other new person. Where's the hand? It just went down. Someone had their hand up. Am I not seeing? Yeah. Aaliyah. No, I mean that was that was that was my hand. The, no, no, this is a the, new I person. Know, this, yeah, no, this is a new person. It's A L I A L I Leo Suleiman. Suleiman. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Sister Seal. Oh. We're not. Yeah, we're not hearing you or something. You're breaking up a lot. Is there something? Can you hear me now? 
We can hear you, but it's a lot of static, and so we can't make out what you're saying, unfortunately. I don't know if you have another number or another line. Try it again. Yes. So can you hear me now? So. Ah, uh, yes, that's much better. That's much better. That's great. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are geographically resident. Uh, my name is Alius Lehman. I am uh, based in Nigeria, also a Pan-Africanist. And then, uh, thank you. I had the submission that was made by other speakers, and uh, I will just add little from what they have said. Actually, we have discussed about Africa's contribution to the world's civilizations. And the African contribution to the world civilizations is something that uh, can never be overemphasized. But for over the years, African history has been twisted by Europe and America. Unfortunately, when you come to the continent of Africa today, they have abandoned the teaching of African history. In our school curriculum, they have manipulated our school curriculum in Africa, whether in Nigeria, whether in Kenya, whether in South Africa. They don't tell us that hieroglyphics and cuneiform were the first two people that invented writing in Egypt. They didn't tell us that in our curriculum in Africa. They didn't tell us that uh, the Benin kingdom is larger than the, sorry, the Benin uh, walls is larger than the Chinese walls. They don't tell us this in, our, in African history. They don't tell us this. So I think it is a right time now that we must rise up together and ensure that we have, uh, uh, we have corrected the uh, African educational system curriculum. And thank you now, the diasporans are rising more than ever before. The diasporans, Africans are now recognizing that the only way we can lift ourselves from the morass of underdevelopment is only when we con when we connive with the diasporans, because diasporans have a lot of works to, 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 uh, to offer for the continent of Africa. In Tango now, the African Union are even trying to uh, you know, to have an to have a like a avenue for the diasporans so that the diasporans can have say in the decision making processes of the African continent. And and I think this is a great move. It is high time that now diasporans should make their should give their own their own contributions for the uh for the upliftment of this continent. Thank you very much. My name is Alius Lehman. And where are you located? Did you mention Benin? You said? Uh, where are you located? Did you say Benin or where are you located? Uh, um, my name is Alu Silem. I am from Nigeria. Nigeria. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we have, um, I think, we're, Yo, do you want to wrap up? I see Cecile, do you have something quick? Uh, because I also need, we have six minutes over. I just, just want to. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, you I just want to say there. that what the young man said is so important because we need an African-centered curriculum. And yes, Nigeria was one of those places that had been taking this history out of their own curriculum. This curriculum is the key to why we are the way we are. When other people around the world learn about black people, they don't learn anything. It's like we're invisible, right? And one of our professors said that it's, it's history is really about the future. It's not really about the past. Because if you remove us from all of the history and then remove us, nobody will remember we were here. So this is very critical, what the young man just mentioned. Thank you. Okay, and so we're gonna to go to Akil, but we need to wrap because we, uh, uh, okay. we're going I'll to make be it out. Quick. Yeah, we're going to be out. Let me say too, but Ghana has the same problem, but the president, the leaders of the government are asking them to change some of the curriculum. And for anyone who's in Africa or has some access, look at the uh, MOUs, if you can even, if anyone, if anyone can find the actual MOU document, for the one belt, one road uh, for different parts of Africa. Look it up on Google, how many countries are in just about every country in Africa uh, has that uh, MOU to see what does it look like and what did they have to give up for that MOU. I haven't found anyone who has that, but go ahead, uh, Akil, quickly, and then we want to wrap yeah. up and get make sure everyone knows who wants to be a part of this, how they can do so. Okay. Yeah, thank you again. I wanted to just uh, first just thank the folks. I invited a bunch of people in here. I'm, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, about four or five people on here. And then I wanted to just say that when we're looking at uh, the issues here, one, one of the things that uh, I'm a member of the Black Inventors Hall of Fame, 
and we're in the process of developing a museum. And uh, uh, one way I want us to think about this is that we can think that those folks who were the inventors who, who created many, many, many of the things that we have today were the Afrofuturists of the past. And so uh, we have stoplights all over the world today because Garrett A. Morgan was a futurist uh, back in the day, and he invented that and invented the gas mask. So we've been futurists, and I think we need to put in proper context that that is our history, and we're just building, or not just, but we're building on that history that we have already been doing. So let us let us re, re, re understand that part. Uh, and the last piece is that I, I, when I graduated from grad school uh, back in early 2000, um, I, I started a project I'd never finished, and that was called uh, uh, Race in Space and the Space Race. And I think that, you know, we really need to kind of revisit that idea because that's been a, uh, um, a, a an idea that I've had that I think we need to, you know, kind of spend some time on. Because when you think about uh, the space race that we as Africans, uh, um, and when you look at race in general, the, in space, there's very few people other than Europeans. They have a, a couple of, you know, the Chinese and maybe a couple other folks that are involved in it. But what is our place in space in, in that? And in when we're there, it's not just about us being in places. It's about what we're committed to while we're there. So you have some Africans who are astronauts, but are, are any of those folks pan-Africanist? Are they thinking about the African future? Or are they completing the agendas of Europeans? And uh, Carter G. Woodson, I think, was a, was a great person for us to think about in his miseducation in the Negro to think about what is it that we get when we go through these institutions. And we need to look back at those things so that we're not just regurgitating white supremacy with some other kind of a, a paint on it. Uh, and where we're clearly doing, using our scholarship, our, our artistry and everything to the benefit of African people from a Pan-Africanist perspective and from a Bootu perspective. Thank you. Thank you. And so I'm going to turn it over to you. One thing for everyone, I've been seeing some things in the chat. This session is recorded. I pushed every AI and every button that had to do with note taking. Not sure how that's going to turn out, but this recording will be done. Uh, go ahead, you. Yes. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for participating today. I want to be uh, thank Prophet for inviting me. Um, also, I put the way for you to participate in the virtual December 13th um, micro organ organization meeting. There's a QR code at the end of the PDF letter. You have to scan that code in order to apply to register. There's no other way you can register. So please do that with your phone. And it is very unique to your to your phone and your IP address. <laughs> so uh, that is one way. The second thing I wanna say, please, is send me or send profit or send to the WhatsApp group your ideas about the future. Again, I will put together all the links to the documents that I referenced on a web page for you. But if there's anything that came out of today, if you've got one, three, four, five suggestions, we can at least put that down as like a blueprint to add on to for the December 13th meeting. So again, I wanna say thank everybody, thank everybody. And I hope my urgency was felt um, because it is urgent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yul. And the let me say this, I want to go to, um, uh, just to say to everyone, if you go ahead and join the Afro for you in, then some documents will be put there even if you don't see them here or you don't get, so if you go there, we'll be posting, 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 posting. And the sooner you join, the better, because once I vet, I vet everybody and then I add them in because I don't never know who's, you know, who who's doing what on from outside of here. But, but so if you join it, we'll be posting, posting, posting. So just give me a minute to get you in, but the, the uh, documents, the links, the whatever will be, will be put there. And so, um, um, and I see Yvonne is back. She's uh, been um, uh, having difficulty with her internet. We're so grateful that you <laughs> that you kept pressing yeah. ahead to get in from Kenya. It's so great to have an international group here. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Prophet. I just wanted to say real quick, I'm sorry about, I'm, I'm having problems with the internet. I'm sorry about that. But I just wanted to say real quick, I think it's in 2022 that the working group of experts of people of African descent they had a conference in New York about 
our curriculum, about our um, literature. And in this conference, they concluded that oral cultures from Africa, from black and brown people should be considered just as important as the literature and the cultures and the ways of learning of the Western world. That means we should be able to find a way to find this document, not to find it. It's it's in the working group of experts of people of African descent, but to use this document where they said, this literatures and this oral way of passing on information is actually an illegitimate way of learning. It's, it's a, an accepted way of passing on our cultures and our information. It's just as good, if not better, as what we are doing right now. And this gave us actually the leeway in, especially in Africa, to be able to contest the fact that we are only learning uh, ways and through what uh, the Western world and cultures want to teach us. This gave us uh, a, a few strategies on how we can also fight for our own forms of learning, our own ways of passing on information to the younger generation. I will, I will find that document and pass it on because we also said in this document that a lot of times our children are discriminated because for example, a teacher will ask a child that is of African descent I'll give an example in Switzerland, a question, and this child may take a minute longer to respond. And that is because the child will receive that answer and the child will understand really quickly, this is not my mother or my father talking to me. I have to code switch. You have to remember these children speak Switzerland. We have four national languages. And then depending on which African parent this child had, let's say it was me, I speak four, uh, African languages as well as that. So my child will already be speaking eight because I will make sure I teach my child my languages as well. And this child receives the question, it will code switch and it will try and understand who asked me this question? And depending on who asked me this question, I will pick which language I will respond to this person. I will pick which behavior, in which way I will respond to this person. That's why our children take a minute longer. Not because they're not as intelligent, because they are more intelligent. They're already code switching. They have to, because they deal with different personalities and cultures every single day with everybody they they they, uh, they come across, everybody they encounter, every, every question they us. And that is why they said oral cultures and other cultures that are not Western cultures and other forms of passing on the knowledge have to be accepted. And it is a document that was written down and signed and agreed on by the working group of experts of people of African uh, descent in their conference in New York on African descent children. So let's look at that so that we can use that also to fight for our, our cultures, our ways of passing on information. Another thing is somebody, I did mention that a black woman, an African woman did have a hand in writing Black Panther. Most people don't know this, yes? And she's called Nendi Okufor, Okafor. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, but look her up. You will find this. And this is these are the kind of things most people don't know. And if we don't look for this, we are erased from all these amazing things that we do. Somebody also suggested, and rightly so, I mean, look at hidden figures. Who would have thought that a group of black women had a hand in doing so much, so much to do with technology? You know, unless we fight for ourselves and our, our places in history, we will always be erased and they will never document that we were there. We should do it. So. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, yep, I'm in Africa, it works. It works, we just have to be patient. And that is the same thing that happens with what we are trying to do. We need to keep at it. We will get there because like I said, we are the source. So let's not give up, please. Thank you. And like Prophet Anul said, you know how to find us. They already mentioned that. Please, please join. We have to come together for this. This is a big thing. Let's let's get on board and, and keep working on this, please. Thank you so much, Pio. And we've had, well, we have four people that, that have joined. Some were already members, so we appreciate that. And so the fight, the resistance, and we do that on our own fronts and how we do. Uh, and so even one way of fighting, 
wrapping up with this. I see you, Dr. Lemmy, but we're like already over time. The um, Well, we have a few people you can, um, and then I'm going to stop recording. It said one way to fight um, is to take care of ourselves and practice our culture. We don't even have to try to get them to like it. We just do it. If we do it, if we walk it and talk it and do it, then that is a way of doing resistance. We can, because I'm kind of done with spending a lot of energy trying to convince anybody anything. But, but that's just me. We're all in our own spaces. We have the we have the quantum physics. We have the healing. We have the arts. You didn't talk a lot about your arts. We'll have to have do another one of these, Yvonne. I know you do a lot of wonderful work with tying in art with all of this AI stuff of things amazing that I have not even heard of. So we're just, uh, let's see what um, Roxanne. Gay, who is Haitian, also wrote Black Panther. So that's what, thank you, Dr. Lemmy. That was in the chat. But we're going to wrap it up now because we're going to, we want this to be a recording. People can actually watch it. We'll do it again. But thank you all for coming. Thank you for all your wonderful comments and uh, input. Our wonderful, outstanding guests. It's just such a privilege to have you, even to know you both. Because again, this was so far from my understanding back December last year when I skipped your side event. <laughs> So anyway, thank you all because we're getting ready to uh, wrap it up. Thank you everyone for listening. Bye-bye.